Welcome to the 2021 Soccer Down Here Season Kickoff Roundtable. And what we have uh, decided to do this go round is bring in three of the voices for the franchises, for some of the franchises here in the Southeast in the USL Championship and USL League One. Hanging out with us for the season kickoff roundtable this time. And we're going to go in alphabetical order for the name of the city that you represent. Nice. So we're going to go Mike Kelleher, the Chief Operating yeah. Officer of the Charleston Battery out of the USL Championship. Doug Irwin. Vice Chair and Chief Branding Officer of the Greenville Triumph out of USL League One. Darren Van Tassel, owner and president, South Georgia Tormenta out of USL League One as well. Guys, great to see you, now, albeit in this uh, Zoom kind of setting in, in a live element, but it's good to see you guys as we're getting ready for the season. Welcome. Thanks, John. Great to see you all. Yeah, super happy to be here. All right, so uh, what I'm going to do is I'll, I've got some questions and I've got an order as to how I want to kind of do things. And I'll start off by doing it by city. So we'll go alphabetical. So, uh, Mike, the first question, we'll start with you and we'll go Mike, Doug, Darren. So, Mike, you first. And it's a question for all of you. When it comes to lessons from the last 12 months of operating a franchise, Mike, what's the biggest lesson that you learned in the last year? Yeah, I think we, we spoke about this before, John, on many occasions. It was certainly flexibility and adaptability that, that you, you never know what's going to be thrown at you in, in the world we're in right now. And so it was, it was for uh, you know, our staff, uh, our, our front office to be very flexible, adaptable and make things work. And, and whether that was you know, putting a, a game on in front of no fans, to 250, whatever it was at the end, it, it, it was to make it work and make it... Um, put a product on the field that, that we could still watch and see and enjoy. Um, and, and that's certainly what we've learned. And we, we continue to do that as we, we hopefully get out of this, uh, this situation we're, we're all in. And we'll get into that in, in a little bit as we go here. And so, okay, Doug, Mike mentions flexibility and adaptability. How did that apply to what was going on there in Greenville for you guys? Uh, you know, Mike said it really well. And I, and I think something I'm sure that we all did is, you know, you were forced to get creative. Uh, and I think for us, it was trying to find opportunities out of something that was, you know, huge, huge adversity for us. And, and I think back to, uh, you know, we were able to to use COVID and, and some of the restrictions that we had not being able to host fans at the start to be able to get our match uh, our matches on local TV for the first time. So, you know, born out of something that was um, unfortunate and, and kind of a necessity to get people to see our matches outside of just the ESPN platform is, you know, trying to look for those wins uh, wherever you could get them. And, you know, like Mike said, it might only be 250 fans, but I I'm sure I speak for Mike that it probably felt really good to successfully and safely host those 250. And I, I remember back before we, uh, before we were able to officially welcome some fans back, you know, we had uh, player wives, girlfriends, families, and there were about 75 people in for a closed door match. And I mean, we were terrified because uh, because you still just didn't know much at that point. And to be able to do that, uh, you know, it really, really showed the strength of our staff. And I think, you know, that's it, it just tested everybody in all of our organizations. And uh, we certainly learned a lot about uh, about the people we have working for us. Darren. What did you guys learn about yourselves? I mean, Doug mentioned all of the, the fears that are attached to, to something like this, yet at the same time, Mike has the, the joys of having folks in the building. Doug had folks in the building uh, a little bit. What were some of the things that you got to learn about yourselves down there in Statesboro? I just go both of those points. People matter, um, and you better be where your feet are. And if there was ever a moment this thing that we just are going through and hopefully coming out of it. People matter. Your coaches matter. Your players matter. The people you work with matter. And guess what? The people that live in our towns where we try to operate matter. And we are all collectively experiencing something really tough at the exact same time. So, um, you know, there's something, I don't know if it was new, but it was, it was a massive reminder. Love Mike's point about being flexible and adaptable and, and Doug's point about trying to figure all these pieces out along the way, but 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 people matter, and and, and we learned way more about how much they matter and about ourselves th than we asked for. Um, but the creativity creativity juices had to flow, and and I think we did learn um, some things um, there, and, and we'll keep diving into those, you know, throughout the hour. All right, so I'm going to call snake draft. 
you know, like when we do fantasy football, it's like you go one, two, three, and then the third guy goes, and then we're going to go that way, at least for this particular part. So okay. since, Darren, you got the last question, you're going to get the first question of this round. When it comes to this season, there have been some things recently that have made news for, for Tormenta in USL League One, and it's about bringing folks to the park. And we've mentioned creativity with the last question. And there are some things that uh, are mentioned with our four-legged friends and also in helping out the community this go-around. Where did those ideas come from? And for those that don't know them, what were they? Well, all pets can come to Tormenta games throughout the year. If you're against puppies, then we probably don't. That's not a fan base we're going to cultivate. And we're also in this really strange public health crisis. And because Georgia permitted the vaccine to go to 16 and above a little bit earlier than some of the other states, and because some of our medical folks um, were, were very willing to do it, we're gonna have a, a, a vaccine clinic at our first home game. Seems to me puppies and public health are easy things to get behind and easy to talk about. And um, listen, we want some good stories. We're searching for them, we're dying for them. And, um, and this is some good time to be doing it. I, I, I can tell you, I think a lot of people really like the, the puppy piece to this, including my own puppy gets to come now. But um, I, I, I think as states are able to do it, I think the ability to do some vaccinations at our, at our sporting events around the country, I think that's the next step. We're a little fortunate in that we had some doctors and pharmacists who just had the abilities to do it and to be flexible. So that, that idea came straight from our front office staff and our coaching staff, um, quite frankly, and uh, kudos, kudos to them. And um, we're eager to get going. We flexed from Johnson & Johnson to Moderna because we had to. And, um, you know, we'll see. To tell you the truth, we haven't really admitted this in some other settings yet or been at up front about it, but we're going to try to do it every home game and, 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 and until we don't need to do it anymore. So... You come to a Tormenta game, you can bring your dog and get vaccinated. Doug, when it comes to being creative about what's going to happen at Legacy early this year, how far back did you guys start your thought process about being creative about letting folks in the door this year for a, a defending champ? You know, uh, I, think, I think that process honestly started in March 2020. Um, you know, I, I, I distinctly remember – when um, things, you know, really went south in a hurry and, and we realized the season was going to be delayed about two, two weeks before it was set to get started, we immediately started working on, uh, on plans to safely welcome fans back at, at various levels. And uh, I think the Miami Dolphins were one of the first organizations in America um, or sports teams to come out with safe stadium guidelines. And we poured into that uh, Miami document and pretty much spent all of April and May uh, just planning. You know, what does what does 500 look like? What, what does 50 look like? What does 1,000 look like? So, um, you know, for for us, I think the easiest thing to, to do, uh, at least at the start of the season, is to pick up where we left off at the end of 2020 um, in terms of our fan capacity with 50%, uh, but in reality, it's a little less than 50% because our ticketing partner does uh, has a social distancing algorithm in it. But, uh, you know, for, for us, it's, it's, again, just how do, we, how do we get creative for how we take care of people in stadium, but also what are we doing, you know, going back to things like the TV deal for our fans that aren't yet ready to come out uh, to games because we know and we heard all last year from a, a very large portion of our, uh, you know, diehard fans and supporters that, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be out anytime soon and it's nothing against you guys, so – um, you know, we had, we had to approach it with two, two schools of thought and, uh, you know, certainly it, it kind of dampens things a little bit from a raising a banner perspective when you can't have a full building. Uh, but you know, we're, we're hoping we can spread some things throughout the year. And if, if things continue to improve, we can, uh, give all our fan base a chance to celebrate the championship. Mike, Doug mentioned capacity 50% with an algorithm there put into play. What's the approach for Charleston? Uh, hoping to bring in more fans as the season goes along there at Patriots Point, which was a big key for the team for last season, coming back toward uh, downtown. And it has been some tremendous, uh, tremendous impact that the idea has been there. But what's what's it looking like for Charleston as the season starts and as you guys want to continue to move forward? Yeah, very similar to Doug, that we'll be at 50%, certainly for, you know, 
we're still four weeks away from that first home game, May the fifth. Uh, we'll be at fifty percent. We've only got a, a few hundred tickets remaining, actually. So the the take up has been fantastic. I think, uh, as you know, we had a you know we're all in the same situation a year ago, but we were in the middle of moving stadiums. And, and getting Patriots Point ready. So, so it has allowed us to, to take a step back and, and we're going to be really ready come May the 14th. We've got a brand new video ball going in right now. I've actually just come from the stadium. Um, we have a stage area for bands, singers to go on pre-match, uh, a little area where they can you know, we'll do a post-match thing as well. We've got a little kid zone, which will be a mini 2v2, 3v3 pitch going in there. Uh, VIP container bar. And, and then we've got the drink rails. We've got lots of room where, where fans can spread out if they don't feel safe sitting in, you know, we're not going to cram them into the seats because we're at 50%. But if they don't feel safe, you know, walking across people, we've got a large area that they can stand and watch the game from and spread out. So I think it's going to be, you know, obviously we're, we're outdoors. It's going to be a good environment. We're not certainly not closed in. Um, and, and I think it's going to be, you know, having had the year we've had, I think a lot of people are going to look forward to coming and, and, and watching live sport again. All right, let's talk about your individual communities and following with the, the format here. Mike, we go to you first. In this last 12 months and as you're getting ready for this particular season, how have you guys as an organization tried to stay active in the community knowing all of the different variables that you have to tackle when it comes to social distancing and impact and all these kinds of things? How have you guys fought against that and tried to, to be a part of the community still knowing the difficulties that you've had to face? Yeah, well, that's been very difficult from the traditional methods where you would have your players going, you know, going into schools, going into you know, local youth soccer, whatever it may be. So we've had to get a little bit of creative and, and you know, a lot of kudos to our, you know, our new marketing team that, that's done a great job on social media and, and, and what have you. Um, one item that we have done is, is you know, I was, I was talking to Jason earlier, We've done some community soccer work through myself. Uh, you know, we, we had some of the players pre-bubble that were here throughout, you know, during the off-season that come out. And, and I've been out, you know, working with some uh, lower-income areas that we've been just play, playing pick-up soccer with the local police, the fire department, and, and it's been a real feel-good uh, few weeks. We actually just concluded it yesterday as we get into the season. That's something we want to do more of in a, in a post-COVID world, if you like. So, but yeah, be, being creative, again, social media, online stuff, um, and, and, you know, the whole you know, change of, of uh, logo, change of, of ownership, change of stadia, I think we're now in a position where, where the Charleston Battery is going to be, you know, well received again and to more people in, in Charleston with the, with the move to closer to downtown. So I think we're you know, looking forward to that as well. And so, Doug, Mike mentioned what it's like for, for him in Charleston. What about you in the upstate where you have the ability with your footprint you can kind of drift toward the, the Georgia line a little bit. You can work your way up toward Asheville because of where the, the TV market is uh, designated. It's an Asheville, Greenville, Spartanburg TV market. And so there are a couple of different directions your footprint can go. What about for you with all of that extra space? You know, for us, uh, it was it was a huge challenge like it was for us all. Uh, you know, again, not being able to to activate and empower the players to get out in the community you know, they, they love doing that. Uh, it's, it's not just the team forcing the players to get out in the community. So it has been a little tougher. But, uh, you know, one of the, the first things we did last year was we um, we turned to uh, to the United to the United Way of Greenville County and, and tried to, you know, go to where the um, where the community was focused, which was COVID relief. And we held a big uh, virtual fundraiser for COVID funds and, and raised over forty thousand dollars for uh, Greenville County in a couple of weeks. And that, that was a fantastic way to, to tie in and, and make it about, you know, more than just soccer. And since then, it's just been kind of kind of trying to to just informally um you know, talk to our fan base, talk to people in the community, see how they're doing, uh, you know, check in. I, th I think we, uh, we've we all learned to uh, adapt to outside weather a little bit more <laughs> and temperature variance because I know we've had a lot of our, a lot of our staff and some of our players go to, you know, viewing parties, uh, you know, just casually outside at places. I know in the winter, we're all standing there under, under heaters watching, uh, you know, watching Champions League and EPL matches outside. So, so we've had to get a little bit creative with things. But, uh, you know, I, I think the being able to raise money for COVID relief in the upstate and, and to get those funds directly back, um, back to not just the county, but specifically some of the areas of Greenville where we play and practice in have been, have been huge for us. And, 
you know, we know that's the the kind of thing that gets our uh, our club out in front of people that might not have uh, been to a game or even heard of Greenville Triumph yet. So that's something that's been a great a great building block for us. And Darren, you're pretty much the same as Doug, where your footprint can go a lot of different directions and you're linked by an interstate to Macon. You go the other way, you're to Savannah, you go north and there's a lot of real estate there that you can head toward Augusta. You go south of the interstate, you're working your way toward the swamp. There's a lot of room for Tormenta to cover at the same time to face those kinds of challenges. What's it been like for you to try to stay involved in a large pocket of the state of Georgia and in South Carolina as well. What's it been like for you? You know, the, we, we, listen, Mike and, Mike and Doug are spot on. There's a couple of strategic things that we did um, following the good work that, that Doug had done in, in Greenville. We now have a linear TV deal in Savannah and, and that television footprint really probably is the Tormenta footprint almost identical as well. Um, stretches into the low country of South Carolina, just a little bit into, into Hilton Head, but, but clearly off into, into Georgia quite a bit. Uh, you can't cover the Atlantic very well with TV signals once you hit Savannah. But the, we, we probably did a deep dive into our academy with our first team and our coaches as much as we've ever done and going directly to make sure that that part of our larger community was, was connected. You know, when, when players can't make the appearances that Mike was talking about just because of, you know, for safety reasons, you know, they're still employees and we have to be um, good employers in that regard. The traditional ones didn't didn't work as well. Uh, Mike, I wrote down uh, pick up games with the police and fire department. So I'm stealing it. I'm going on record. Everybody can hear because um, what's what a beautiful it's borrowing, Darren, you know. borrowing. Yeah, I borrow and will steal um, too. But so many good ideas and um you know, it, it really is probably worth saying here at the outset, you know, you know, being on here with what Mike's done at the Battery and what, what Doug and everybody else are doing in Greenville, it's, it's a fun time. We, we, we do borrow and steal, but we lean into each other a lot. One of the things that's happened probably when you, if we define community even bigger, John, is that the, the ownership teams have leaned in each other in ways that I just don't think they normally do. Um, and, and, and that community is a very active one in, in League One. I can't speak directly to the championship, although and we have bits and pieces with some of those contacts, but the ownership group in League One is, is, a, is a very strong one. And without this past year, um, you know, those, those, those ties that that part of the soccer community wouldn't have grown. All right. Darren, let's talk about this season. You mentioned the, the TV deal. You mentioned getting ready for your first, your first action in USL League One. When it comes to expectations on the field this year in USL League One, what's Tormenta's expectations? I know that uh, there's been a coaching change at the top, and there's been some things uh, coaching-wise inside the organization. What are the expectations here in 2021? You know, I think all three of us on this call are – expected to go undefeated and win the Rose Bowl there you without go. question, right? And, and we're all really optimistic. It's, it's part of our job that, that we do. Um, I, I think we're especially optimistic with the team culture, the team climate. Um, we're healthy right now. Um, we had a really tough preseason and, 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 and feel quite ready and prepared for it. You know, we, we were able to get going uh, February 1st, but quite frankly, because of COVID, so many of our players – never left Statesboro. They were here year round. So that was a new dynamic. Um, there might've been an off season, but, but players were still around. Um, we're pleased with where we are. We wanted to go, you know, the leagues let us all flex a little bit earlier if we wanted to. So we're opening it up um, this weekend. That's really important for us in a university town that we get going while, while schools are still in. Um, and you know, could not be more pleased with how our preseason has gone. Um, and I could not be more pleased, I think, with how our front office has worked um, through it. And as I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm quite tickled with the strength of where our academy is, too. So we're, we, we really think of ourselves as an organization is uh, while, while the, the shiny car is, is the first team and the pro team, you know, for us, uh, we're going after three championships this year. 
Um, one's in USL League Two and one is in USL Academy, and, and we're really eager to, to, to get things rolling. And the other one would be USL League One going up against the next guy that uh, we're talking to here. Doug, what's it like having a bullseye on your back as you head into this season? You know, I kind of feel like we had one on our back all of 2020, too, coming off the uh, the final against North Texas. You know, it's uh, – the atmosphere is – it's intense. I mean, it's uh, – preseason's been a lot of stern uh, tests for the club. You know, we, we started with D.C. United up in Raleigh and were able to manage a draw there and then had a, another really hard-fought draw against uh, Mike and Charleston a couple weeks ago in, in a great, um, great physical match that was back and forth and – then uh, we, we got humbled a little bit against Louisville uh, last weekend, made a couple couple miscues that cost us a few goals, and uh, we close it out uh, this Saturday against Charlotte. So, we, you know, we feel as battle-tested as you can be uh, coming out of a preseason. And uh, But, you know, I think kind of the unknown for all three of us on the call is how are we going to react to a full season again? Uh, you know, that's 28 matches is, uh, is a lot for us coming off of uh, a limited slate last year. And, you know, uh, we've got Open Cup to worry about, hopefully, if that uh, moves forward. I know they just had to take a round off of it. But I think the uh, the depth and uh, certainly our athletic trainers for all three of our, our clubs are going to be tested this season. So that's something where we, we really got to really gotta pace ourselves and uh, don't want to, you know, we got a target on our back, but we don't want to get a – get off to too frustrating of a start it's a, it's a long season compressed into a short amount of time and mike you've still got a couple of weeks before usl championship kicks in and i know that by the time that your season starts your guys are really going to be tired of going after each other in practice and they just want to go after another team uh things are a little different with the uh, division alignments in the usl championship this year some of the uh, traditional folks that you've been playing over the last handful of years won't be there as a part of your regular schedule this year. When you look at the changes in the championship with the division alignment and things like that, you're still a couple of weeks away. What do you see? Yeah, I said earlier, it's been a strange time because we've had a long off season and now a long preseason. So just want to get into it really now at some point. Though, though having said that, we're still a few players short, uh, knowing we've still got three, four weeks to go. So um, you know, excited to play. Um, certainly want to get back playing on, on a regular basis, playing games that mean something. Um, we're now, I think I'll put this one in now, we're looking forward to our 29th season. And, and as it is every year, this is the optimistic time of the year when we're all on a, a level playing field. No one's kicked a ball yet and we all think we're going to be winners, as, as per Darren's point. Um, or hope to be winners. You want to set yourself up to be there. But certainly was very encouraged, excited by the team that was put together last year. The majority of which are back, um, very young team, and and um, you know looking to add to that, we've added two or three players already. Looking to add another couple. Um, unfortunately, we you know we, we had the the relationship with Ibernian, but with the the flight restrictions, we haven't been able to bring a couple of those players in right now that, that we'd hope for. Um, but we'll still look to see if we can add a couple of those as as Hibernian season comes to a close in Scotland. So you know, we're really excited, really looking forward to some of these players coming back. We've got. Four that were away on international duty earlier on in the, you know, when we started pre-season, we were very depleted. We played a couple of MLS teams who were fur much further along the line than we were. And, and we had four players who, who was, you know, arguably were pretty much starters playing for their national team. So looking forward to getting everyone together. This is the 2021 Soccer Down Air Season Kickoff Roundtable with... Mike Kelleher, the Chief Operating Officer of the Charleston Battery. Doug Irwin, Vice Chair, Chief Branding Officer of the Greenville Triumph. Darren Van Tassel, Owner and President of South Georgia Tormentor from USL Championship and USL League One. Mike, heading back to you, you mentioned Hibs, so I'll go ahead and open that door. And this, this particular question, uh, I want to talk about the growth of your clubs, I guess, in, in a national and an international landscape. And it's more of a crystal ball question as we go. Uh, Mike, I know that you, you mentioned the, the issues, obviously, with the travel restrictions and such. But the relationship with Hibernian, obviously, it's another piece of the puzzle for Charleston to grow globally. Look at that relationship and how would you like to continue to see it grow and flourish as we go and hopefully come out the other side of what we've been going through the last year? Well, I think the last time we spoke, we, we just sent a couple of players over there. Well, one of which was, was Robbie, who was in Scotland anyway. So Robbie and, and Leland Archer, uh, our Trinidad International, both spent a, a long period of time training with Hibernian. Um, not quite enough to get offered a, a, a full-time contract, but that was fine. And, you know, that was that had been the ice on the, on the cake. 
um, the following piece would bring to bring their players here, but obviously we, we've been set back with that. Uh, but we, we've speaking to them every week. Uh, there's a number of things we're working on. Not quite ready to, you know, you know, looking hopefully for youth summer camps, maybe with some of their staff coming over, coaches, potentially the head coach coming over to spend some time here. And then, you know, looking to go the other way, myself, Mike Anhauser at some point, probably be me before the end of the season, heading over and spending a few days in Scotland, um, how we can work together. And, and just another piece, you know, we're not just finishing with Hibernian, I'm actually in talks with a, another couple of clubs to, to work in Europe where we can work closer with. And, and from our point of view, and, and I've said this a few times, I think we're seeing the transfer market open up in North America now. We're, you know, not, you know, at the very top end with Christian Pulisic, um, and you know Alfonso Davis, I think you know, very, again the very very top end, but it will filter down. And, and we've got you know we've got saleable assets within our club as in players that we think could have an opportunity to go and play in Europe, wherever that may be. And by forging these relationships, we're giving them an opportunity to go into that club and and spend some time you know training for two, three, four weeks where where it might have been. A couple of days before that, but because we have that relationship, we can we have those eyes can be on those players throughout the season, and and uh, we have an opportunity to move them on and, and and be the club where a young player wants to come here because it shouldn't be the last port of call, the Charleston Battery. It should be an opportunity to go and play on to, to bigger and better things. So so that's kind of the where we're aiming to be in this global. You know, you mentioned about the global market for Charleston Battery. That that's one of the key areas for us in the next you know coming months. And if you'd like to break the news about which other clubs you're having a relationships with, feel free to break them on our air at any time. Just to putting oh, that. Well, no, I'll let, I'll let you know. Absolutely. All right, Doug. What about you with uh, with Greenville as Greenville continues to grow in the landscape? Obviously, having a head coach like John Harks, instant drawing card championships, another drawing card there. What is the the future looking like in, in the, the global landscape and then the national landscape for for Greenville as you guys continue to grow? Sure. Well. After the 2019 season, we were able to transfer a couple of players up to the championship, which was uh, awesome for us, certainly, uh, to, to have some assets that, uh, that we could move on and give guys some new opportunity. But, uh, you know, interestingly enough, John, right now, I think one of the big focuses on the club hasn't been as much the, the international, national, um, you know, expansion in terms of player talent as it has been locally. Uh, our coaching staff, John Harks and, and company, have been – uh, really deepening our relationships with all the local colleges and upstate South Carolina is just a, a great uh, hotbed for, for college soccer. And what we've been trying to do is, is you know, deepen those relationships and, and get more of their players on trial um, and, and not, you know, not with the intent of immediately signing all of them, just giving some guys, some, some local guys, some opportunities um, to get in and train with the team. And we have made a couple local signings and, uh, hopefully a couple more to, to come as the uh, college season comes to a close. But, you know, it's, it's very important for us. Uh, we we kind of say that we're, we're kind of coming from the top down a little bit. Uh, you know, we eventually someday um, would love to get into the League Two uh, business as, you know, Darren has successfully done and continues to operate. And uh, we, we want to get more guys on academy contracts for the club. And, and we don't, you know, we don't have our own youth academy, but we, We've worked in the past with a couple of local academies to have a guy, uh, a guy or two on contract. But I know that, you know, again, going back to the point I was making earlier about how we're all in for a really long season and a compressed time, we know that uh, fresh legs are going to be crucial. So if we can work with some of those local colleges, some of those local academies, especially as uh, restrictions and protocols continue to loosen up to, to get more of those guys ready, you know, we're going to need a deep bench and we want to take advantage of that local talent. And Darren, you know, Connor Antley comes to mind as someone who spent time with Tormenta and ended up going to the to USL championship. But also to Mike's point and to Doug's point, there have also been instances where because of those tentacles that you already have in place there uh, from Macon to Savannah, you're signing high school kids who are part of the Savannah footprint, bringing them in as a part of the Tormenta organization and growing it that way as a part of your local growth. So you're seeing those kinds of dividends already paying off for you when it comes to your build from the bottom up. The academy piece is super important to us as well as transferring. So, you know, Connor Antley, as you mentioned, now with the Rowdies, and it's great to see him in our preseason match with them. And, you know, he, he's clearly an MLS-bound talent. And, and we've had some really successes with the League Two folks 
who have moved up to our team. Um, JJ's playing at Greenville with Doug and and Leland Archer and Nico Rittmeyer playing with Mike and, and the battery. And they came to us, you know, from, from our League Two ranks. And on the academy side, we have five of them that are playing with us. They're training every day. They are more than holding their own. Um, a couple have already signed uh, some, some Division I college scholarships. We got an invitation in the offseason to be a part of the new MLS Next with our academy, too. So what's been a fascinating piece to this is the number of international coaches who now want to come join Tormenta. We're not hiring, I will tell you. Um, we're full, but it, what what the USL has done for us and, 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 and what's happening on the academy side is clearly putting us in the radar of some, you know, some long connections to, to make a part of. We, we were fortunate we got to play Atlanta United in a, in a preseason game and, and, and CF Montreal and, and, and played well in, in those matches, but I think just starting those relationships take lots of places. You know, Mike, our, our, our relationship with, with Mike and the battery predates, you know, way before we were even League One. And that was a super important connection for us to, to, to make. And, you know, we borrow in a lot of those things and uh, with those relationships. Getting our academy into that process has been uh, super important too. And, we mentioned relationships, and this is the, the next question here, and it has to do with the geography. As we had this round table, Darren, you're in Statesboro, Doug, you're in Greenville, Mike, you're in Charleston. To see the southeastern part of the United States be in a position where you have multiple franchises in multiple leagues with rivalries that are either developing, burgeoning, or were already in place in a bunch of different levels and are where they are, to be able, Darren, to be playing a team in Greenville, to be able to play a team in Chattanooga as a part of league play and then driving up to Atlanta and playing Atlanta United to go to Florida and, and take out CF Montreal. has What has it been like for you? I won't necessarily ask if it's been a surprise, but what's it been like to see the growth of the sport specifically here in the Southeast? Well, it's been fun to be a, a part of the driving force of that. I think it would be remiss if we didn't say, probably none of us could do anything that we've done if it wasn't for the work the battery had done way before all of us. You know, they've been here, Mike, just remind us of 29 years. They came at a time when it was a lonely world for pro soccer in this part of, part of the country. And, and, and they held on and kept pushing and pushing um, and, and gave, you know, those of us that have sprouted up lately the chance to kind of find our own uh, wind beneath our sails and to run with it. And so having said that, I, I will at least want to acknowledge the people that have been doing all the hard lifting and heavy lifting before we got here. It's also a strange piece in which, you know, college soccer was here before pro soccer was, in which academy, high-end elite academies were here before pro soccer. It makes the growth of, of soccer in the United States odd in that regard, at least compared to other countries. But it's also, it means there's a built-in skeleton for us to draw ahead of it and to begin and, and to make those relationships. It's an honor to help grow this game. Um, and it's a, it's a big responsibility. And I think we feel it every day here. And Doug, where you are, you're right there as a part of it too. You're a part of these rivalries with Darren. You're a part of the rivalry with Chattanooga. You've got Charlotte coming online in Major League Soccer. You have Atlanta United two and a half hours from you. I mean, you're right there smack dab in the middle of a, a section of it too. What's it been like to see from your perspective? It's been amazing. And, and as Darren said, it, you know, it's, it's a little odd the way it's come with, with college play and youth play and, and, you know, having the battery around too, as you know, growing up as a Greenville lifer, if people wanted to go see a pro soccer game, they drove down to Charleston, you know, all my buddies, that was their first taste of pro soccer. Wasn't, you know, going up to DC or anything like that. It was going to a battery game. Um, but, but for us, it's, it's just been exciting to be kind of that, that final piece in upstate South Carolina, because as I mentioned, we've had great high school soccer. Um, I, I, I went to a high school that's won a number of, of state titles. And then, uh, you know, with with the college soccer, specifically Clemson and Furman, I mean, you know, Cl Clint Dempsey still talked about uh, to this day all the time about his time in Greenville with Furman and, uh, you know, certainly with uh, Aguchi Onyewu and Stu Holden and others at Clemson, you know, it, there's there's been almost a pro feel to it before. 
So to, to be able to grow it and, and make pro soccer accessible to people in the upstate and, and to have these regional rivals has been huge. And, you know, I know we're not in the same league as, as Mike and Charleston, but we've been able to, to play them, I think, three years so far. And it's something we want to continue doing. We think, we think it's great. And, you know, going back to what you originally said, John, about how, how important are these regional rivalries for the future, they're huge. Uh, you know, we, we all know on this call that the more bus trips as opposed to plane flights is what's going to help make things sustainable for us as we continue to move forward. And, you know, uh, people always talk about, uh, John, you referenced earlier the, the DMA for Greenville, including Asheville and our, our territory, including that. And people say, well, would you, would you guys be upset if, you know, Asheville ever came in and got a League One team? No, we'd be thrilled. We'd be absolutely elated um, because to be able to, to, to build those rivalries and, you know, you, what you see that minor league baseball was able to do, albeit I'll a, a, little, a little bit more of a struggle now after uh, taking away some teams is, you know, our minor league baseball team in Greenville can play, uh, can play Charleston, can play Columbia, can play Asheville, can play Myrtle, you know, all these, all these great teams. But uh, to be able to bring that element into, into soccer is, is going to be huge. And, and we've got three very distinct areas of the Southeast that, uh, that our three teams cover. And I just love that we can hop in a car and, and go see uh, each other's games. And Mike, do you think of Charleston as, as a flag bearer and as a role model in all of this, considering the, the, the tenure that the battery have as a part of this particular topic? Do you guys consider yourselves role models for what the Southeast has done and where it can continue to go? Um, yeah, I, I think so, John. Um, it, it's, you know, I've, I've, obviously I can't claim anything for, for 29 years. I'm, this is my fifth year here. But, you know, you, you have to think back to, you know, Tony Backer, who, who founded the club. And, and I think that name doesn't get mentioned enough sometimes as a pioneer of the game in this country and, and what he did here and, and the stadium he built here and, and the amount of money he put into the club. I think it's, it's incredible that, that we are looking at our 29th season here. And, and then so many other excellent clubs are joining us, you know, not, not least Greenville and Tormenta and, and, and the future looks really bright, particularly as we look towards 2026 and the World Cup and, and the spotlight that's going to be on this country and our clubs here. And, and I think we, we've we got a great opportunity to continue to grow the game. You know, I, I'm coming up to my 20th year in this country working in, in, in soccer at one level or another. And, and you know, it is really night and day. And, and my, you know, for my first year, I was working with the USL and, and, and I left the Premier League to work at the USL. And, and that was night and day in, in many respects. But, but where we've come in, in 20 years is it, incredible. And, and, and the stadium that's going up you know, across the country and at different levels, whether it be MLS, whether it be League One, Championship, whatever it may be, I think we're, we're at an incredible time to be working in the game in, in, in America. And uh, you know, not least that the fact that we have in the Southeast, we've got the three clubs that are on, on the call now and, and uh, exciting times ahead. Three separate titles here uh, among the three of you. And, and let me ask you this, Mike. What's the hardest thing about being a chief operating officer? I don't think there's a... No, I, I enjoy my job every day. I don't think there's a hard thing about it. I really don't. Uh, you know, what's the hardest thing? Um, or is there something that's the most challenging aspect uh, that you're still trying to tackle? But the hardest thing maybe is I can't play, John. You know, I'm not a player in this organization. I'm not good enough. It's never good enough. So, um, but, but the, yeah, I think... I don't have a. I love my job. I love what I do. I don't. There's anything that, that you know. Yeah, sometimes I haven't. Fortunately, I haven't had to do this too much in the last. You know, firing people can often be the hardest thing you do, and tell people that they, you know, that unfortunately it's not for them anymore, and, and that, that's a t that's real tough. Um, or, or telling you know at some point you know I, unfortunately I don't have to do this piece if it's more of our head coach and, and I'm, you know a player that you're not quite good enough. You're not going to re-sign a player, but no, I love what I do. I love working in in, in the best game in the world and and. You know, one of the best cities in the world. So I, I've got no, nothing to complain about, John, unfortunately, or fortunately. <laughs> so what's the toughest thing about being a chief branding officer in Greenville? Oh, man. Uh, you know, it's, it's tough to, uh, to hold state secrets, I would say. <laughs> uh, you know, we've, we've got a lot, of, a lot of things in the works, and, uh, and to, be able, to have to sit on those for months on, months on end is, is really challenging because we have, a, we have a, a grand vision for this club and the continued expansion of it. And we got a lot of cool things in the works uh, that I wish I could share. Um, but, you know, I, I think outside of that, I, I think what's, 
what's challenging is given the length of our season and this, I don't think this is exclusive to my role as much as it's uh, all three of us on this call is, is staying focused on the day to day in season while also planning for the future in the months and years ahead, because we're a, we're a part of, of a, a soccer league as a whole in the United soccer league that is growing just immensely uh, between championship and league one. So, you know, we, uh, we want to be flag bearers in our respective leagues for, for, uh, for the USL and, and focusing on that, but not forgetting that, you know, you got 14 home dates and that you got to pack the stands out to be able to accomplish all those long-term goals. And, and Darren, I know as someone who is as a part of the fabric of Statesboro as you and your wife Nitra are with this organization as owner and president and, you know, city steward and area steward. I know that there's a lot of stuff there for you. What's the hardest part? Well, you know, flippantly is Greenville's winning too many championships in our league. So we have to help that a little bit. Um, you know, I, Cedric, I think all three of us agree. I don't think we have enough time to think about what the hardest parts is, are. We, we, we don't have the luxury of, of doing that. You know, where, where I sit, we have about, almost 80 people that work for Tormenta FC. That's, that's a lot. Um, most of those aren't players. So those are some different needs. Um, you know, if it matters to them, we try to make sure it matters to us and we, we have to get, we always reserve the right to get smarter. Um, and, and so keeping that stuff rolling, you know, I think one is we Tormenta's specific challenge is that, you know, one of our biggest challenges is also our strength. We're in the smallest, professional market in the United States. I mean, one of the next smallest ones is probably Greenville, but the difference between us and Greenville is night and day in terms of our, in terms of that market. So, um, you know, you know, fighting above our weight on the market side just means we have to work a little bit harder, but it's also really re rewarding. Um, you know, I'll just flip it. And even if all it anticipate the next question, what's the most rewarding part? Um, working with the, the people around the league. Um, that's the one I probably enjoy the most. Um, uh, clearly working with our players and our staff is unbelievably rewarding, but being part of a bigger movement at a bigger time, the 2026 piece that Mike mentioned shouldn't be lost on all of us. I, I don't think we're going to recognize the USL in 2026 from our 2021 vantage point. And, and, it, and there's a lot, lot to be done but um, we're pretty ambitious in terms of what lies ahead. So for someone, Darren, who has never been to Statesboro for a Tormenta match, what would you tell that soccer fan or even someone who's just interested in going to Statesboro and seeing something at Tormenta? How would you present Tormenta to the soccer audience that may not have, ex have experienced it yet? Well, to the soccer fan, they're going to love it because it's high-paced, fun action. We get after it, and, and and I think it's attractive and fun to watch. I I think for the non-soccer fan, it's I, I think they're really surprised how close they get to the action um, and how fast and how athletic that it is. I'm not sure you really have to understand all the nuances and the art that's in play to not be just completely mesmerized by the experience um, of the match. I'd love to tell you that Tormenta is unique in that regard, but I, I think that's just what high end um, professional football can get to folks. And I, all three of us play in, in stadiums where you get to get close and you get to feel it. And um, that's a pretty re rewarding piece. Want to make you come back. All right, Doug, what about Greenville? Obviously, it's a hotbed for a lot of things. You know, we've talked about college athletics just down the road or there in town at other places and in minor league baseball. For someone who's never been to Legacy early to see the triumph, what would they be experiencing? What have they missed out on so far? How would you put, put on your marketing hat here for a second, your branding hat? How would you bring folks in the door? You know, a couple things. One, Darren said it well, you know, I, I think that it catches people off, off guard how high level uh, the soccer is, you know, at, at both of these leagues. Um, you know, it's exciting. Pace of play is great. The talent level is great. Uh, I, I think the first time I was, you know, really exposed to USL soccer, I was very impressed. Um, the competitiveness, you know, we don't we don't have a lot of blowouts. Um, 
and and the competitiveness is is there between League One and, and Championship squads too, um, when they when they get to play one another. And outside of that, um, you know, Darren said this too. You get you get really close to the action at, at our stadium. You get a little too close to the action sometimes. We had to uh, kill some seats last year because they were within six feet of players. Uh, but you know that's that's a great thing. And and I just think you know getting someone to a game. As, as you said, you don't need to know all the nuances. Uh, soccer and hockey are the two games that you just – you can't replicate uh, what you get when you're there at a game. It's just totally different. Um, and and the people that have experienced when, – when we market the team, when I tell people about how we like to approach um, our marketing strategy, I say – I feel confident enough in our game day experience that all I have to worry about is how do I get them there for the first time? I don't have to worry about how I get them back if they've been out. Cause I think we put in a, a good enough product and good enough match day environment on the field that we'll get them back. It's, it's just getting them, getting them out for that first game. And then Mike for Charleston, obviously, you know, moving from Daniel Island to Patriots point, it's been a, a part of this and coming back to downtown uh, obviously, it's a hum- it's a humongous drawing card for the battery. What about from your perspective for Charleston? Yeah, I remember just over it. Well, a year and a half ago, probably now. Um, Rob Salvatore take me around at the College of Charleston, and, and if you'd been to the, the Patriots Point facility before, I found it very hard to envisage what he was telling me, and, and it was going to be uh, trying to recreate what Charleston's known for: the food, the drink, the that the whole fan experience is going to change. So, but now you'll see, you know, we're going to have food trucks in that, that represent Charleston, what people come to Charleston for, the, you know, the, the, the great uh, restaurants that are here in town, the, the, the whole experience. And I think we're going to try and replicate some of that, the atmosphere that we're going to have in, in the, uh, like the pavilion area, if you like, that, that, that you know, with, with music going on. And I think it'll be a totally different experience that anyone's exp- that has done before. Uh, certainly in Charleston anyway, for, for a live sporting event. So, so we're going to look forward to, to how that goes across, and and uh, um, and like um, you know, like Doug was saying, the first thing, the hardest bit was getting them into the stadium, and I think we'll keep them once they're here because it's going to be a totally unique uh, environment to, to to come and watch one of our games now. Last go round, and guys, thanks for for hanging out with us here for the uh, the season kickoff roundtable. Mike, let me start with you. What's the best piece of advice that you ever got? when you were getting into this business that has carried with you to today? You know, back a long time ago now, that was, uh, um, I don't know, it, it was, I remember some advice. So I got, I took a job at the Premier League as, as the young guy in the office, helping the, the administrator uh, to, to do the player contract scheduling for the Premier League. And, and eventually very soon I was into the, running the academies. Um, and it was a, a coach, a professional club, who, when he was a, he was a coach at, at West Ham, he said, remember, you, you need to be a politician. And, and I wasn't sure what he meant by that. And again, this is in England, so, so maybe the meaning might be a little bit different, but it, just be, be careful what you say and who you say it to. Um, and, and just, uh, yeah, be a, polit- be a politician, uh, if that's right. And, and that's kind of stuck with me a little bit. And I think, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm still here five years in into Charleston. We've had a lot of changes and, and, and I'd maybe... Me still being here was being a little bit of a politician from that advice 25, six years ago, whenever it was when I went and worked for the Premier League. Doug, what about you as a, a vice chair and a CBO? You know, I, th- I think the, the first thing that comes to mind is something that Chris Lewis, our team president, always says is, uh, you know, just remember how lucky we are to, to get to work in sports and to, to be able to do and create what we do for people in the community. Uh, it ties back to our mission. You know, we're trying to bring people together and create joy through soccer, uh, you know, creating joy. That's, that's what all three of us are doing. We're, we're making memories for, for, you know, families and young professionals and, and these players and coaches. And I think uh, we need not lose perspective because we all know that the hours are, are very long um, and, and grueling and uh, there, there's, there's, it's a, it's a very high stress job, but, but the reward at the end of the day, those, you know, those 14, 16 matches, especially when you're able to uh, pack the stadium or, or even just welcome a small number of fans like we did last year, uh, that, that feeling is, is just fantastic and, and never take it for granted. Darren, what about for you? What's the best piece of advice mm-hmm. you have ever been given that has stuck with you today in all of the aspects of, of the business that you're in? 
that timeless motion picture from Disney, Ratatouille. There was a quote there that one of the characters said that great chefs can come from anywhere. Uh, they can come from the smallest of markets. Just because you're in a smaller place doesn't mean you're less sophisticated. And I think, I think the players where we can find them for us to play can come from anywhere. And I think our, our ability to create great fans and, and sponsorships can come from anywhere. So, so we need to keep our eyes wide open for such things. Um, you know, there's a, there's a great quote that came from Joe DiMaggio in his, in his famous days as an American baseball player where he got furious with a reporter one time who wanted to know, asked DiMaggio what it meant to be, a, how did it feel to be such a natural hitter? DiMaggio lost his mind and went, took him downstairs in the basement and showed him just how much work went on to be a natural hitter and for him to never call him, accuse him of being a natural hitter again. I don't think there's anything that we do that's natural. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, effort, and, and, and energy. Um, and, and we watch, um, I know I watch these two that I'm on the call with and to learn from. I, quite frankly, I listen to your show a lot as a fan and, and, and borrow um, you know, from ideas that are doing there. We're, we're part of a movement. And um, it's a rare time when you see a sport being handed up from the younger generation north. Um, you know, if, if you grew up in outside the United States, soccer was handed down because it's so generational and so woven into the fabric, much like baseball and, uh, is in the United States, but this is being handed up. It won't always be handed up here. It won't always be moving in that direction. You know, the young people playing today will be great grandparents at one point and it'll be handed back down again. So we've been given a real off opportunity to show a lot of joy in it. Um, so while there may be nothing natural about it and it takes a lot of work to create new habits, I can tell you this, uh, it's not a habit until it holds up under pressure and there's a whole bunch of pressure, you know, for us to sort of get this thing right. Well, guys, once again, Darren Van Tassel, owner and president of South Georgia Tormenta, Doug Irwin, the vice chair, chief branding officer of the Greenville Triumph, Mike Kelleher, the chief operating officer of the Charleston Battery. Guys, thanks for hanging out with us for the inaugural season kickoff roundtable. We'll be keeping an eye on all of your franchises in the USL Championship, USL League One. Thanks for hanging out with us here at Soccer Down Here. We'll be keeping an eye. We'll catch up with you soon.